Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're ready to start. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I'd like to thank my colleague, Council Member Donovan Richards, Chair of the Committee on Public Safety, for chairing this hearing with me t this afternoon. I'd like to also welcome Council Members Holden, Menchaca, and Gibson. Hey, Jamani Williams. Um, today's hearing will explore a holistic approach to addressing the opioid crisis in the Bronx. I use the word crisis because that is exactly what we are dealing with in my district, Council District 8, which includes the Mott Haven, High Bridge, Concourse, Longwood, and Port Morris neighborhoods in the Bronx. For too long, these neighborhoods have had to carry the burden that comes with opioid misuse. It has taken a toll on our residents, on our local businesses, on our law enforcement agencies, and on our communities. In 2017, there were 1,487 unintentional drug overdose deaths in New York City. 82% of which involved an opioid. That means that every six hours, someone in New York City dies of a drug overdose. More New Yorkers die of drug overdoses than homicides, suicides, and motor vehicle crashes combined. Fentanyl, a highly potent opioid, is involved in around half of these overdose deaths. In the South Bronx, specifically in Highbridge, Morrisania, and Hunts Point, Mount Haven, the unintentional overdose rate is more than double the city average. Today's hearing will give the committee an opportunity to hear from the administration and from advocates about the work that we're doing to address this epidemic. We are already committed, we have already committed resources to ensuring harm reduction for opioid users, medicated uh, assisted treatment options, peer programs, opioid antagonist training programs for city agencies, cleanup efforts, and syringe exchanges, and a law enforcement regime that shifts focus from criminal enforcement to treatment of, health, of a health crisis. We in the city are doing a lot, of, a lot to address this, but we need to do more so that this does not become normalized for our children living in the South Bronx. No child should have to grow up seeing struggling people in the streets and discarded needles in the parks and playgrounds. We need to do better for our communities. I wanna thank the administration for the commitment that they have made to bring more resources into the Bronx, and I look forward to hearing more about all of the work they were doing and the role that the city council can play. I also wanna thank committee staff council, Sarah Liss, Policy Analyst Christy uh, Dwyer, finance, uh, finance Analyst Jeanette Murrow, my Chief of Staff Millie Bonilla, and my Legislative Director Bianca Almedina for making this hearing possible. I now turn over to Chair Richards for his opening statements. Good afternoon, and I want to thank Councilman Bayala for convening this hearing and inviting the Public Safety Committee to join for this important topic. The truth is, part of me wishes that I didn't have to be here. I wish the Public Safety Committee didn't have to be here. Drug addiction should be a topic for the Mental Health Committee, and I look forward to a day when I or whoever chairs this committee doesn't have to wonder about who the NYPD is arresting for having what I believe is a medical illness. And I'm not saying that to be critical of the NYPD for doing exactly what we have asked them to do, what the penal law tells them to do. Drug addiction has been a problem since long before the opioid crisis, and the choices made by public officials here in New York City and in the state legislature over the last four or five decades have required NYPD officers to arrest people for being sick. Decisions made by people within the court system meant that these sick people were sent to Rikers Island to get better until they could plead out and end up back where they started. And we all know how that worked. Today I'm encouraged that some things have changed that drug courts, alternatives to incarceration, community-based solutions have been utilized more and more and jail less and less. But that shift also means that we need to come up with other answers for New Yorkers who live in places like the South Bronx. People who on the way to work see addicts injecting themselves out in the open, people whose kids see syringes piling up in their parks and on their street corners. They rightly wonder what we are doing to fix this problem in our first line of defense, they asked the NYPD to please do something. And I'm sure for the officers who take their mission to clean up the streets to heart, it is hard to see someone they've taken off the street end up right back there the next day. I wish I knew exactly how to get us out of this crisis. Hopefully today we can move forward with a solution, and my guess is that the esteemed witnesses who are before us have some good ideas that I'm look, looking forward to learning more about. But one thing I do know is that we are not going to arrest our way out of this crisis. 
It has to be a medical solution, a community solution, not just a law enforcement solution. Thank you, uh, Chair. I want to also recognize Council Members Miller, Van Bramer, and um, Council Member Colwyn. I believe I saw him. Uh, we will now, Committee Council will now administer the affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Good morning, or good afternoon, Chairs Ayala and Richards, members of the council and committees. My name is Dr. Hillary Cunnins. I am an assistant commissioner at the, uh, at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene heading up the Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Use Prevention, Care, and Treatment. I am joined by my colleagues at the NYPD, Deputy Commissioner of Collaborative Policing, Susan Herman, and Assistant Chief William Aubrey from the Detective Bureau. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on the opioid overdose epidemic with a particular focus on the Bronx. And before I begin, I just want to share my own uh, personal commitment to improving the situation in the Bronx. I'm a physician and practiced uh, in the South Bronx uh, at 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, and then all the way far up north to 161st Street for more than 15 years. And I know firsthand from my patients and colleagues about the many uh, challenges and opportunities that we can find there. As Council Member Ayala really very clearly said, we are indeed in the midst of a national drug overdose epidemic being driven by opioids, primarily heroin, but also the potent synthetic opioid called fentanyl. Between 2015 and 2016, the rate of overdose deaths increased by 51 percent in New York City. From 2016 to 2017, the citywide rate of increase did slow to 2 percent. However, there were still almost 1,500 overdose deaths in 2017, the highest number on record. This works out to one New Yorker dying every six hours of overdose. The vast majority of these overdoses involved an opioid, a total of 82 percent of these deaths. In 2017, for the first time, fentanyl was the most common substance involved in overdose deaths in New York City, constituting 57 percent involvement in all these overdoses. And as I indicated, there are some signs of progress here in New York City. 2017, there were fewer overdose deaths among Staten Island and Manhattan residents compared to the year prior. But the rate of overdose deaths among Bronx residents continued to increase with a 9 percent rise from 2016 to 2017. And in 2017, more uh, 363 Bronx residents died of overdose, which was the highest among our city's five boroughs. In particular, as you already heard, the South Bronx neighborhoods of High Ridge Morrisania and Hunts Point Mott Haven had overdose death rates more than double the New York City average. If the South Bronx were its own state, it would have the fifth highest overdose rate in the country. In response to the city's overdose epidemic, the administration launched Healing NYC in March of 2017. Through a more than $60 million investment, New York City has led the nation in funding and implementing effective public health strategies to address these preventable deaths. Healing NYC is now a 13 strategy plan aiming to prevent opioid misuse and addiction, increase connections to care, prevent overdose deaths, and reduce the supply of dangerous opioids. Recognizing the Bronx's, the South Bronx's outside burden of fatal or drug overdose, last week Mayor de Blasio announced a Bronx action plan. Before describing that plan, though, I want to acknowledge the role in particular of inequities in race, in economic opportunity, and in others in shaping the severity of the Bronx epidemic. I also want to acknowledge this is not the first drug overdose epidemic the Bronx has seen. 
There are many root causes of overdose and substance misuse, including too frequently prescribed opioid medications and the emergence of fentanyl in the drug supply. But the root causes of the op opioid uh, overdose epidemic, in particular for communities of color and in the Bronx, also include poverty, lack of economic opportunity, trauma, and importantly, past drug policies that have not, as you also have heard from Chair Richard, addressed addiction as the health condition it is, and which have led to missed opportunities for people to engage in health services. Now I would like to summarize the $8 million four-part plan that will enhance and tailor Healing NYC and Thrive NYC strategies for the South Bronx. The first part of the plan will establish and expand programs to connect people who use drugs to care and services. The Health Department recently lost, launched Health Engagement and Assessment Teams, or HEAT. In a team consisting of a social worker and a peer advocate, HEAT will accept referrals from first responders, including NYPD, FDNY, and Parks Department staff, to engage and connect with people who have substance use disorders and other mental health conditions. There will be two HEAT teams in the Bronx to support first responders in substance use related calls. Additionally, the plan will fund, provide funding to three syringe service programs working in the South Bronx. This funding will enable expanded outreach and engagement of people who use drugs in parks, other public places, and connect them to ongoing care and support. The administration is also expanding programs that focus on reducing risk of overdose and increasing connection to care and treatment in other locations. At Health and Hospitals Lincoln Hospital, an addiction consult team called the CATCH team will expand the hospital's capacity to provide tailored care to patients with substance use disorders. At Bronx Care, the Health Department will expand its relay program in the South Bronx, bringing the program to the th a third Bronx hospital. Relay deploys peer wellness advocates to emergency departments 24-7 to provide overdose prevention information, naloxone, and follow-up care to patients following a non-fatal overdose. The Health Department is also expanding access to buprenorphine treatment in primary care settings through our Buprenorphine Nurse Care Manager Initiative. Buprenorphine and methadone are the two most effective treatments for opioid addiction, and buprenorphine can be prescribed in primary care settings where many patients prefer to seek care. Under the Bronx Action Plan, two newly funded organizations will bring the total number of Bronx Nurse Care Manager sites to eight, which is nearly one-third of the city's 26 sites. Additionally, we will nearly double capacity to reverse op overdoses due to opioids by distributing 15,000 naloxone kits to Bronx opioid overdose prevention programs by the end of 2018. Since the launch of Healing NYC, over 20,000 naloxone kits have been distributed in Bronx neighborhoods. And the Health Department's Rapid Assessment Response Team will initiate a new round of engagement in Bronx neighborhoods with high overdose death rates to reach community members at risk who may not already be reached by harm reduction or treatment providers. In the second part of the plan, we seek to expand community partnerships. To engage community members in preventing overdose, reducing stigma, and helping connect people to care, we aim to strengthen community partnerships across the many strong community organizations, local leaders, including tenant associations, business groups, faith organizations, and more. The administration will use a number of strategies to accomplish this goal. The Health Department is partnering with Radical Health, a Latina-run, South Bronx-based organization which takes a grassroots, community-organizing approach to improving health. We will also support the newly launched Faith and Harm Reduction Initiative, which will engage faith communities in overdose prevention and build capacity to provide educational resources to their communities. Latinx Thrive will host roundtables with local leaders and NYCHA resident leaders, and Thrive NYC will sponsor a Bronx Opioid Awareness Day of Action this January. 
I also want to commend and make you aware of the work of the Bronx Opioid Collect uh, Collective, to which City Council has generously contributed funding. The Bronx Opioid Collective is a consortium of service providers and community organizers, uh, organizations convened by Acacia and the Third Avenue Business Improvement District. The Health Department and the administration will continue to work with this important group, providing technical support naloxone, as well as staff to aid with weekly street out outreach to people who use drugs. During these outreach efforts, we offer a range of services and referrals, including harm reduction services and other referrals to health services. The third part of the plan seeks to increase public awareness about the dangers of fentanyl and the availability of medications to treat addiction. The Health Department will launch a campaign focus on the risk of fentanyl, which is being mixed into illicit drugs, including heroin, cocaine, and crack cocaine. Because fentanyl is very potent, a person can overdose even after ingesting very small amounts. We will also relaunch our Living Proof public awareness campaign that features real New Yorkers, including several Bronx residents. In these ads, New Yorkers speak about their own opioid addiction and their treatment with methadone or buprenorphine. Together, these advertisements provide accurate information, spark open conversations about substance misuse and addiction, and decrease stigma associated with its treatment. The final and fourth part of the plan responds to community concerns about public drug use and syringe litter. In response to community concerns about syringe litter and public injecting in parks in the South Bronx in particular, the Health Department joined with the NYPD, Department of Parks and Recreation and Social Services, as well as local community-based organizations and syringe service programs to implement a multi-pronged solution. The Parks Department has installed 44 syringe disposal kiosks in 41 parks with the greatest number of unsafely discarded syringes. These specially designed kiosks include signs that encourage proper syringe disposal and raise awareness about available addiction-related services. In this plan, the administration is also expanding its capacity to clean up syringe litter. The Parks Department will dedicate six new staff to routinely canvas and clean high-volume litter areas in the South Bronx parks, and the Department of Sanitation will address syringe litter in heavily affected areas outside of parks. I want to especially thank Chair Ayala and Council Member Salamanca for organizing the walkthrough of several key blocks in the South Bronx last week. It was helpful for me and the rest of the administration's team to see these issues firsthand and to discuss possible solutions. I want to also thank the Mayor and First Lady for their unprecedented support for this effort and Speaker Johnson, Chair Zayala and Richards and the other members who are here today for your partnership and voices. Together, I believe we will be able to change the course of the opioid overdose epidemic in New York City. We are happy to take your questions. Thank you. So I think, I think the question that everybody wants to know is, when did the city know that the Bronx was in crisis, and why did it take us so long to get here? So uh, I very much appreciate the question. Um, as you know, we had a citywide plan, and we have already launched a number of services that I'll also just highlight to hear, some of which you heard about already. We have Relay, our ED-based non-fatal overdose response program, in two hospitals already. All of the health and hospital programs are advancing emergency department-based work. We already have launched six buprenorphine treatment programs. We have already funding, providing funding and expanded funding to syringe services and working with other treatment programs. So that citywide approach has been important and I think is part of what has slowed the overdose rate down from that very large increase of 50 percent down to only 9%. But as you know, no, no life should be lost. And I think what we learned by looking rapidly or more rapidly at data, we knew that we needed a tailored response that goes beyond the original citywide and Bronx-specific plan. And so this is what this represents. 
Do you feel that, is it, is it your opinion that the closing of what was formerly known as the hole in the South Bronx contributed to the rise in opioid-related deaths? I mean, what was the city's strategy? Because I know there was a, there were a lot of community concerns about what was happening in the hole, but I don't remember and I can't seem to find any data that explains to me what the city's response after closing the hole was. And so obviously we're getting a visual effect, right, because we're seeing uh, individuals now openly using on our streets and our playgrounds. But was there a response in 2017 when the mayor announced that he was going to shut down the hole? Um, so uh, that effort uh, made by the city was really a collaborative uh, effort across uh, many city agencies, uh, as as and I know the mayor feels strongly, and and obviously we we share that that those conditions were unsafe, and this is something we wanted to address. Many of the agencies went in to offer services ahead of time and following up, to engage as many people as possible in ongoing care. Um, so I think, for, and the other thing I'll just mention is. We believe that some displacement has taken place, but as we also know that people are being displaced from other parts of the city and not, it isn't a single issue problem. So I think we have started outreach, the, and I mentioned the Bronx Collective as, weather, as well as the Bronx Task Force that has been taking place. Um, and I think what this represents is further enhancement of those efforts and further resources. So, so we don't know really what the root cause was for the uptick in the South Bronx. Is that what you're saying? There's of no overdose. Real... Yes. Well, the other thing to call out is the increasing presence of fentanyl in the drug supply. So for people who may have been, um, uh, have a substance use disorder or an addiction who used heroin without fentanyl, it may not have been lethal. But the current challenge that the city is facing is with increasing amounts of fentanyl in the drug supply, even very small amounts of fentanyl can be deadly. So the, the usual image that people give, and if you, you can see this on the web widely, is a picture of a penny with very small amount of grains of fentanyl, and that is something that can cause a fatal, non-fatal or fatal overdose. And so we think that is really uh, a big part of what's driving what we're seeing now. Understood, but I'm sure that fentanyl is also being distributed in Brooklyn, is being distributed in Queens, um, is being distributed in Manhattan. Why the high number in the South Bronx specifically? We're trying to figure out why in that particular part of the district are we seeing? Uh, it's it's possibly more. It's possibly that uh, we need to work harder to reach more people with information, tools such as naloxone, uh, awareness about the, the presence of fentanyl. I'll also note that uh, Brooklyn also saw an increase in overdose deaths, and we are uh, continuing to work hard there as well. When the administration announced the launch of Healing NYC in March of 2017 and the initial $38 million investment in the initiative, it stated a goal of reducing opioid deaths uh, by 35% over five years. However, between 2016 and 2017, opioid overdose deaths increased by more than 51%, and between 2017 and 2018, they increased by more than 4%. Is there a 35% reduction in overdose deaths by 2022 still a realistic goal? Uh, and if so, specifically, what actions will be taken to ensure that, that, that decline? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The, so Healing NYC was announced, of course, uh, in the third month of 2015, uh, 2017, and we are still, and I think this is an example, able to grow and tailor programs as we go. Uh, I think we are keeping on that goal and really trying to explore every strategy and be flexible and through collaboration with colleagues across the administration to try everything that we think could possibly have an impact. The, you mentioned the R Collect, uh, the uh, the Opioid Collective. Were they involved in in advising in which in ways in which the uh, the broader uh, Bronx Action Plan would be implemented or should be implemented? 
So we, um, uh, our, my staff, as well as staff from other agencies, have been working very closely with them. They were part of what raised our awareness and informed the plan around, in particular, syringe litter and in particular around, uh, around public drug use. So our work with them and their, uh, our general experience with their experience informed some of the approaches we're taking here and we'll continue to take with them. Can you explain a little bit more about the syringe litter uh, program? I mean, well, the part of, part of the initiative. Sure. So I think it really consists of uh, a couple of different parts. One is the presence of of kiosks and that are labeled as safe places to dispose of syringes. Uh, and I think what is part of our approach with both outreach and making kiosks available is. Uh, supporting people to dispose of syringes safely in neighborhoods, to care for parks, to care for communities. So it's it's really providing access to safe disposal. The other part is uh, making staff more available, city staff to provide efforts to clean up from the ground as as we saw when we walked with you. The, number, the great number of syringes that are disposed in streets and in the park and is really an effort to clean that up and keep that clean. The other part is to have more present and consistent outreach to people who either are both themselves at risk of overdose, who might be interested in obtaining uh, access to services as well as supporting their use of the kiosks. So is sanitation going to be picking, is sanitation going to be... So there's a piece with? both, sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm being yeah. more abstract than I need to. So both parks is getting additional staff who will increase cleanup within the parks and sanitation will be increasing cleanup around the parks. And I'm, I'll assume that they'll be trained specifically on how to properly pick up... Absolutely, and absolutely. And park staff are already being, uh, who are involved with this effort, are already being trained to do this safely. And certainly that's a very important part how of, frequently? of this. I don't, they have been trained and there is, I'm sure, regular training, but I'd have to get back uh, to how it. How frequently are they gonna be, uh, are, is the, are the pickups uh, scheduled to occur? I, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay, we'll so have to get back to you. Um, interestingly enough, this summer, um, I came across uh, the block, one of the blocks that you, you referenced earlier that uh, we had the privilege of walking through um, to familiarize ourselves with some of the issues that are impacting the, the South Bronx. and. In that specific community, we have five uh, programs. We have um, a safe haven that is, act this is actually occupied by active uh, users. And I was really shocked at the number of people that were, I mean, I got there at 9 o'clock in the morning because the Art Collect the Bronx Collective was actually hosting um, one of their activities at the local playground where they were distributing needles. And there were needles distributed throughout the entire block. There was a daycare program right across the street from the safe haven. We knew, uh, what well, we later found out, but the city knew that uh, all of the occupants in the building were active users um, and that we have a problem in the South Bronx. I don't know why. I mean, I'm assuming that that was part of the, the rationale for placing that, that there, but it was right across the street from the public housing development, the playground, and the daycare program, which is a half a daycare, half a, a church. Um, and yet nobody seemed to have picked up on the fact that this was happening. And I got there at nine o'clock in the morning, uh, parked my vehicle, and immediately, I was there three minutes when I witnessed uh, several people shooting up, shooting themselves up in the neck. I uh, got out of my vehicle. I'm like horrified because I'm, you know, my 45 years I had never witnessed something like that um, face to face. I have heard of it. I've never seen it. Um, walked the entire block to get to the park where this this activity was happening, and the entire block seemed to me like they were under the influence of something. There was a uh, evident uh, K2, um, you know, being used as well. Uh, a lot of people shooting up actively. Um, injecting, I'm, let me use the proper language, um, but needles everywhere, just littered everywhere. Now, 
Well, I mentioned this because I had asked that police presence be placed there because while we do not want to police our way out of this situation, there was there's a local playground that was infested with just needles that had been improperly discarded. And people were actively injecting while there were children playing on the opposite side of the fence. This is what this is what my constituents have to deal with on a daily basis. This is what my children are learning. Um, and so it, I was just really dumbfounded that no one had ever approached me while I was actively trying to resolve this to say, council member, the problem is that we are inundated with a gazillion programs. We have a, a safe haven. And I, I walk into the safe haven and they didn't even realize or they would not accept responsibility for their clients not only being in the front of the, 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 the building and really taking over the entire block, but the fact that everybody was actively using and they didn't have any programming. It didn't appear to me they, they had any programming in that site. Um, and so there was, they didn't seem to be very much coordination of, of efforts between the city agencies, between the Parks Department, between NYPD, between the Department of Health, between DHS, uh, the community board, nobody knew what was happening. It was just like a, a, a hot, big hot mess. Um, so I wonder what is the coordination and how do I, as the representative voice for that community, feel comfortable enough that this plan is not only going to address it, but it's going to do that consistently and it's going to take into account, you know, my constituents and what they're going through every single day. Um, so um, I really appreciate everything you just said. Thank you. Um, and I think you've been, um, we have some examples of good coordination in other parts of the city that I think really can be strong models. One example is 125th Street task force and I think uh, elected official leadership there has been vital to its success. I think you have our commitment that we uh, want to replicate some of the coordination that has been effective in other parts of the city and I think with these additional resources we can uh, make that happen and do that well. So I would just like to add uh, that I think the the HEAT teams and the two hospital-based programs are going to be enormously helpful because in addition to arresting people for possession, which we still do, you're going to have a more, um, a different skill base and a different kind of assessment that's possible with these health-only responses. People who will do outreach, conduct outreach in parks, they're going to be responding to requests by local precincts. Uh, we're a primary client, actually, of the HEAT teams. We consider ourselves, the police department considers itself a primary client. Being able to say, this corner, that corner, please talk to this person or that person. Um, that's a whole new level of outreach that we haven't had access to before. So one of the interesting th things that I did uh, witness while I was uh, canvassing this site throughout the summer um, was that while, and, and again, I want to be very clear that we have no intention of criminalizing anyone um, who is chemically dependent in any way, shape, or form and needs help. But because this one block happened to be overpopulated with active drug users, it attracted a lot of drug dealers to this community. And so there were active drug sales happening day in and day out. Sometimes all the police was just really like 10, 12 feet away. How are we addressing that? So we have lots of investigations and we are, we are focusing on dealers more than we are on users. And that's, that's our commitment and that's, that's what's happening. So, so you might see somebody, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an undercover who's around, it doesn't mean that there isn't a case being built and um, dealers who are being investigated. Any way that, I mean, and I understand that some of this is confidential, but that there's a little bit better coordination with the local elected officials so that at least we know, because it's very difficult when constituents, and when you're personally observing and when mm -hmm. constituents are coming up to you on a daily basis and saying, we're drowning here and nobody's helping us, and there may be work that's being, that's happening behind the scenes, but we're not privy to that information. Is there any I think, way? Yeah, I think when you give us information about a particular area or a particular concern, 
We can't tell you, obviously, we can't tell you details of a particular investigation, but we can tell you that we have people in that area or we don't. And that's, we'd be happy to increase that communication. Okay. I don't want to, I don't want to monopolize all of the time, but I wanted to recognize Council Members Power, Powers, uh, Samuel Lamprey, uh, who stepped away, and Council Member Salamanca. Um, hand it over to my co-chair. Thank you. And we're also joined by Cabrera, Cohen, Lanceman, and Williams. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Chair, for uh, your great questions. And I first I wanted to start off by jumping straight into a uh, very interesting question, which uh, some jurisdictions are exploring the idea of safe injection sites uh, for drug use. And I think that's something the health department was looking into last I checked. Uh, the idea is that drug use would at least not be happening in parks and around kids. Um, and that health professionals could control overdoses and make sure people are using clean needles. Um, where are we at with that proposal? Uh, is that something the police department would support? Uh, is that, and I'm just interested in hearing where uh, the health department is at. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, uh, as for, as, as it sounds like you're aware, uh, the, uh, the mayor announced, indicated his support of, as we are calling it here, opioid prevention centers or OPCs, uh, pending a few key steps, uh, including state authorization uh, by the state health department, and that is what is still pending at the moment. And, and, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. and should that authorization uh, come, which we are uh, hopeful for, uh, other steps include district attorney support in, in the borough, elected local elected official support, uh, and community engagement. So at this point, we're awaiting State Department of Health authorization. And you're in communication with them. Do you anticipate a specific timeline on when you're here back? I don't have that information. Okay. And um, when was the last communication with them? Do you? Um, mm -hmm. uh, don't exactly know, probably within the last month, two months. Okay. And, um, and, and if a specific site was to be placed in the community, you, it, I'm assuming you'll follow some sort of Euler process, I would hope, so real robust community engagement. Have you thought that far down the line yet on what that would look like? Um, I just want to correct, uh, Deputy Commissioner Herman just corrected, uh, Overdose Prevention Center, not Opioid Prevention Center, got it, OPC. Right. I got it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we don't we don't have the the full plan for community engagement uh, laid out. We are very we share your um, what sounds like recommendation about a robust process, including working with local local elect, elected officials. So I would hope that uh, any anticipation, perhaps that this may happen, that we start to look at drafting a plan from now and not waiting until we get an approval. Uh, we have seen this happen before um, in many different areas, and I would hope that the health department is really working um, in advance of an authorization to start that conversation now, or at least to draft up a process so that we're not waiting last minute. Uh, I'm going to shift my uh, PD. Do you have any stance on open and I think sites? Commissioner O'Neill has said on many occasions that if they come to New York, that we'll do everything we can to make them work. Okay, great. Uh, all right, I want to stay uh, with you, Ms. Herman, uh, Commissioner Herman, for a second. Uh, how many officers are currently in the Bronx Opioid Squad? I'm going to turn to Chief Audrey to answer that. So last year, uh, the Detective Bureau picked up 95 officers that specifically work in each overdose uh, team. And in the Bronx, they have 19 of those uh, 95. And I know you mentioned that there are some open investigations. How long do investigations so, uh, normally take? So we have, um, it depends on what type of investigation. So there's, there's long-term investigations, which average six to nine months. They could take over a year. Sometimes they could be, uh, they could be closed uh, earlier than six months. And then we also have uh, our shorter-term uh, investigations, which, which could be from 30 days to, uh, to three months, 90 days. Right. And I know that this issue has been going on for around at least two years. I think it's been well documented. Uh, so have there been any large-scale takedowns? Yes. Yeah, so um, 
right now, do you want specifically to Bronx? Because I could. Yes. Let me just give you a little overview, and I'm going to turn it over to Chief McCormick to uh, to get into the specifics. But right now, uh, citywide, we have uh, well over uh, 2,500 uh, overdose investigations actively uh, going on, and of those, 592 are in the Bronx. So. Out these of, are investigations, not arrests. These are investigations involving overdoses, so they could be fatal and non-fatal. So uh, what we built in last year was whenever there's a death, uh, we take it upon the uh, police officer and emergency personnel, EMS, at the scene to, uh, to determine right up front, to make a decision right up front, this could possibly be an overdose. And what we do is we try to preserve that, that scene uh, because there's a lot of valuable uh, evidence that we have that could help us solve that. It's treated like a homicide uh, right up front. Uh, we err on the side of caution and we'll preserve it. The packaging that's there, we'll preserve that packaging. We'll send it to the NYPD lab. Uh, there's a lot of value in that. There could be markings on there. There could be prints. There could be uh, DNA evidence that could lead us to who uh, provided that, who sold that to the individual, as well as uh, media evidence such as, uh, such as a cell phone. A cell phone, uh, we had an incident in Staten Island where a cell phone led to eight other overdose deaths because they use either text messaging, phone calls, or these encrypted applications to communicate with these sellers. So there's, there's a lot of work that's done up front. I could go on if you want, uh, but if you want specifics on, uh, I know Chief McCormick has some specifics on a successful investigations that we've had, uh, we could have him come up and discuss that. Sure. And you said there are 2,500 active investig yes, so, investigations citywide, so, 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 592 in the Bronx. How many have been closed out total thus far? So, tw right. right. So, so these are so, all active. So these, no, no, they, no, they, this year okay. we took over 2,500 investigations. There's over 200 arrests. On, on investigations, overdose investigations. Now we have the, the issue, these are complex cases, so the issue with overdose, and especially when you have a death, with prosecution. So there's a federal charge. It's conspiracy to distribute a controlled substance which results in a death. It's a minimum of 20 years. It's a federal charge that we work with the AUSA. That is our hope to bring every overdose death to that. We've had a dozen arrests this year just with that, and we're learning. Uh, last year, uh, we realized the importance of this charge and how to work with the AUSA, and each borough and each overdose team is working aggressively with the AUSAs to continue on with these type of arrests. And then there's also another federal charge, which is conspiracy to distribute controlled substance, and there's two levels there. If it's 500 grams, that's a minimum of five years, and if it's a one kilo, then it's 10 years. That's another federal charge. And, and then we also have the state laws. But again, um, if we have to prove that I provided either sold or distributed that narcotic, that specific narcotic uh, yep. evidence that caused your death to charge that. On the state level, a lot of times we've been successful with the conspiracy uh, charges, which you're selling controlled substance, and then we'll, we'll arrest you for that. Uh, but uh, Chief McCormick could tell you about some specifics on it. Yeah, and let me go back for a second, because I remember this conversation sounds very familiar, um, leading back to the 80s and early 90s, I'm sure, with the crack epidemic. And I'm interested in knowing who are the people selling on the streets? Are these the same ones who perhaps are adding the fentanyl? or is this happening at a higher level? So I want to hear a little bit more. Who are these individuals who are, who are selling and being busted? Tim. Street dealers, or are these asking, the individuals? Who is selling fentanyl? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. I'm okay. trying to get. Okay. Sure. Just as it relates to uh, two cases I could speak about in the Bronx, uh, one where 10 subjects were arrested. Um, about just about 4,000 glass scenes of heroin, over, over $200,000 worth of cash that have been recovered. Uh, these people are not low-level people. They're high-level people. 
that we're prosecuting. Uh, there's another case in the Bronx uh, where we uh, arrested 18 people, uh, seized over four kilos of uh, heroin, uh, and these are all high-level people. Um, and who are they getting it from is the question. Very com okay. we, uh, when we conduct an investigation, uh, this, the idea is to always work up the chain, up the ladder, so to speak. So we want to get the people that are pushing this product onto the street and killing our children. That's what we're looking to do. And does this work, uh, I'm assuming you work mm -hmm. with the special narcotics prosecutor, I guess. Yes. It, so we, can we, you speak about coordination there? So Leonard we have the benefit on the for bill. the Bronx. Uh, yeah. I have the benefit of working with the Bronx DA, uh, with the Special Narcotics Court here in Manhattan, uh, with the Assistant U.S. Attorney in Manhattan, and also with the Assistant U.S. Attorney in Brooklyn. So I have that availability here. Um, it, it is very difficult. It's very complex. We have these compounds uh, that are coming into our country uh, from Mexico, from China, uh, and we work uh, on not only the street level where we have the user, but you know, as we move up, we're we're moving internationally also. Yeah, and you said ten subjects arrested. These were all local individuals, or the, uh, I, I, because these investigations are active, um, I'm I, I I'd rather not say who they are, uh, but they're significant people who are uh, preying upon our loved ones. On the in the city, and particularly the Bronx, for me. And how old are these individuals normally? On I, I'm not. I don't want to get into demographics okay. of them. But but I, I assure you, the the object here is uh, I do acknowledge that uh, some users uh, will um, sell product uh, to support their own habit. Uh, I think we have a way of dealing with that through the court system, uh, and that's not what my objective in the Bronx is to do. Uh, my objective is, is to get high-level people. And uh, just go back to how many arrests were specifically made in the Bronx? For just for me, for my overdose team this year, uh, I have made 35 arrests. Uh, 25 of those arrests are related to fatal deaths, and 10 are related to non-fatal deaths. You, I just want to be clear. You're talking about the overdose investigations, not Everything. Okay. Let's go into non-fatal for a second now. So what agencies other than the police department come to the scene in the event of a non-fatal? We have that come here. Uh, the 911 the call comes in. You have FDNY EMS that responds. Mm -hmm. You have NYPD that responds. Mm -hmm. You have the OCME uh, would respond, whether it's... OCME? Medical exam. Exam. Medical exam. Medical exam. Mm -hmm. Ge generally, a, a med medical legal investigator will show up. Not in a non-fatal. No. Only in a fatal. Only in a fatal. Only in a fatal. So non-fatal, I want to Correct. hear a little. EMS um, F and NYPD. Okay. And sometimes, I mean, many, many of the uh, non-fatal overdoses, because we've the city has been so good that most of the health department has been so good <laughs> about getting naloxone to all kinds of people, a lot of the non-fatal overdoses are getting naloxone at a community health center. At families are administering naloxone and then calling. 911. So we are, if 911 is called, it's police and EMS. So, health department, so these heat teams, can you just speak specifically to the heat what teams are not with? responding to 911 calls? They're not. No. Okay. So, health department, no one shows up, just EMS specifically. So, so the health department, and Dr. Conant can respond to this, but the health department would get involved in that case if the person is taken to the ER okay. and the relay program is in the hospital there, they would engage that person okay. and offer ongoing assistance, treatment. So no assessment. arrests would be made at the hospital or arrests made at No the arrests hospital. are made there at the home or at the hospital. That's that's the Good Samaritan law. Okay. Um, I know the department has largely been focused on dealers as, as, instead of addicts. Um, is it ever difficult to distinguish between the two and how do you handle that. So I know you went into a little bit about the focus not necessarily so being on arresting. I think the, the 
We are still arresting there? people who possess controlled substances. And in um, Bronx soon, but in all the other boroughs except for Queens, so Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Staten Island, we have post-arrest, pre-arraignment, diversion programs, either HOPE or in Brooklyn it's called CLEAR. Um, in the Bronx, it's going to start within the next couple of months. We'll have a HOPE program there. But the Bronx and Manhattan also have post-arraignment diversion. So once you get to court, they have the OR program that is diverting people. And there, there are assessments done as to um, what would be the next most helpful way to reduce harm. They're all harm reduction focused. So it's not a cookie cutter approach. Everybody is assessed. And, um, you know, Staten Island's been up for two years in January. Um, I think they've had a great deal of success. Brooklyn is doing very well. Manhattan is only in Manhattan North at this point. But these programs are, I think, um, helping a lot of people get back on track. And then if they meaningfully engage, that's the word, and whatever that means um, is different for each person. Uh, their, their case is dropped by the prosecutor and the arrest is sealed. Um, let's just, I just want to delve in a little bit before I turn to my colleagues, just on uh, the local. So obviously this has been a big quality of life issue that I don't think would be tolerated in all parts of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly believe that, you know, anyway, I, I, I will try not to go there. But uh, I just find it horrible that our children have to watch people shooting up next to them in a, a playground as they play. And I find it hard to believe that this would be acceptable in other parts of the city. Um, what options does the NYPD have for dealing with a neighborhood that is frequently overrun uh, with users this way? So can you just go through your... Well, through, So obviously every day they're experiencing people shooting up in public. What yep. has enforcement, and like I said, I know it's that delicate balance. We don't want to lock people up, but what are we doing to ensure that they can have a better quality of life. Well, we are arresting people. We are also now looking forward to, particularly in the Bronx, really uh, using these heat teams a lot, because that's exactly what they can do, is intervene. Um, we are working with um, community partners, you know, syringe exchange programs, everybody that the health department is talking about, we are trying to maximize the outreach that's possible so that people know that help is available to them. Um, that's the, the police role is really um, enforcement and diversion. Right. Um, so if you arrest somebody at a spot today, what does the spot look like tomorrow? Well, if we arrest somebody at the spot today, if that per just in terms of our interaction mm -hmm, with that mm -hmm. person, or no, I'm, I'm just saying with the community. So you went in and you showed a level of engagement. You arrested, took somebody off the street, or those individuals back there the next day. Uh, people still utilizing at the same spot. What does that look like? They may be back there the next day because the individuals that are all um, eligible for all the diversion programs are all DAT eligible. The ones that are going online may not be back there the next day. The ones that are DAT eligible are being offered services. Many of them are being uh, accompanied immediately from the precinct to an assessment center, and many of them starting treatment right away. Um, that's what's happening. That will happen in the Bronx as soon as HOPE starts. In every precinct, we'll have peer navigators coming directly to the precinct, training them in how to use naloxone, giving them naloxone, and talking to them about services, and in many cases, if it happens the same way, and I have no reason to believe it won't, as it is in Staten Island, Manhattan, and Brooklyn, they will go right then to an assessment center who will help someone think through what's the next best step for you. And that's, that's where we're hoping they won't be back in the park the next day. Mm -hmm. All righty, I, I will come back, but I, I just want to make two uh, points. Um, one that I, I really hope we are um, focusing on the individuals who are bringing this stuff in by the boatloads. Um, you know, last I checked, we don't have manufacturing hubs in our communities for these things. And I'm hoping that the, um, the investigations that are happening are really focused on the individuals 
bringing this stuff in by by the boatload. Um, secondly, I'll add that um, in terms of enforcement, I believe that uh, the NYPD can do more. I'm not saying you're not doing anything, but I find it hard to believe that if the department uh, is specifically aware of locations and if they are specifically focusing in on these locations, even as investigations are ongoing, um, that we can improve the quality of life for residents who are just trying to get home or paying their rent, whose children have to walk by this. And I don't think uh, in New York City that this should be tolerated. I understand it's a big problem, but I do believe, based on what I've read, based on what I've heard from my colleague, that there's a bit more that we can do. Uh, do you acknowledge there's more that we can do uh, until these programs are specifically rolled out? And lastly, what impact do you really think these programs will have uh, that are being rolled out by health? I think he's, sorry, I think heat will have a tremendous impact. We've been talking about heat for a long time. And I think uh, the police department being able to call and mobilize heat for these parks or other locations, I think will be very helpful. So we're gonna turn the heat up and? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir, can you just speak Fun to, so these programs are gonna take, just as most city programs, a little help. bit of time to roll out. Um, what can we do in the time being until these programs are fully implemented to make sure that residents have a better quality of life? We, can, we still encourage our citizens to report their complaint. Um, we can take that in and investigate each one of those complaints uh, come up with some common denominators in them and investigate those persons that are preying upon us, that are dealing it. And are you working with local non I'm sure there's some local, not, I think you mentioned nonprofits. What can they do in the meantime specifically? Outreach. outreach. Okay. I mean, so you're working with them and providing them funding to do outreach? We are them not. Funding. You are. Okay, <laughs> I know we are, but yeah. they're, okay. Yeah, but I mean, if, if we're... If we're looking at this as a multi-pronged approach, right, it's trying to get people into treatment, trying to find the people who are really flooding the community with fentanyl and other horrible poisons. We've got to have as much outreach as possible. We have to find other ways to get people into treatment than the criminal justice system. Right. But that doesn't mean that we're stopping our part of it. But it requires everything that you're talking about, the heat teams, the hospital-based programs, and mm -hmm. they've all been ramped up over the last few months. That None of them have been in for a long time. Mm -hmm. And Councilman, I'll just add that, you know. Do you need more resources is the question. Now is the time you understand okay. in front of Oleg and Susan. Could your precinct use a little bit more resources in the meantime? And I don't mean to come If you put it out there, I'll always ask for more. All right, there you go. <laughs> so over the um, course of the next six months, has, can the police commissioner, can you, Susan, agree to ensure that they have a tad bit more resources so that the residents could have a better quality? So of life? built into our investigations, the, gr the boots on the ground that we truly need to speak with are our neighborhood coordinating offices our steady sectors. They're built into my investigations um, where we see fit. They provide us with intelligence. We do investigations. Where we have people that are in desperate need of help that are using, uh, we have them as our microphone uh, to NYC Well, to Heat. They can, they can suggest, suggest to them that, listen, you truly need to get help mm -hmm. while we still conduct our investigations. Unfortunately, they will probably still use uh, but we'll encourage them to the best of our ability while we still conducting investigations. All right, so Susan, can we yeah. get a, them a tad bit few more officers to, to work with you? I think you know that's not my decision, but I'll okay. relay your Can you concern. let the police commissioner know? I will relay your okay. I already have it down. All right, okay. great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think that Council, Council Member uh, Richards has a point. We're dealing with unusual circumstances that require more hands on deck. Um, just out of curiosity, does this extend, do these resources through the NYPD also extend to PSA 5, uh, PSA 7? Because I know that uh, public housing has been, you know, impacted more and more in the last uh, year than, you know, ever before. And there really hasn't been, I've been hearing some of this from some of my resident leaders, but I haven't been really hearing anything from the city around how it's addressing the uh, improper uh, needle distribution. Uh, 
disposals at the public housing developments. Specifically, I'm seeing it at Patterson Houses for obvious reasons, but I have, you know, received complaints of also seeing it at Millbrook, which is a little bit further um, south, and I'm not, I'm not sure. I just wanted to make sure that the PSAs were also a part of this conversation. I can speak to uh, Patterson Houses. Yes, we uh, the Parks Task Force has been meeting with tenants there, uh, as well as Patterson Playground, and I'll check about Millbrook and any other sites that okay. you let, let us know about. We'll, we're happy to follow up. Um, thank you. I wanted to recognize, acknowledge um, Council Members Rodriguez, Brennan, and Deutsch, and I want to turn over the mic to Council Member Menchaca, who has a few questions. Uh, thank you to the chairs and to uh, the NYPD. Uh, and DOHMH, thank you so much for being here. I, I just want to offer um, an opportunity to talk a little bit about some discrepancy that we're seeing on the ground. Uh, in Sunset Park, I represent a few different precincts, so I'll keep it general um, to protect identities on the ground. Um, but, but what's really true and honest is the fact that you have community members that are really engaged on the ground that have been uh, living, owning property for a long time, have seen some changes. Uh, and the NYPD data that's coming down is saying that there's no real increase in crime, no real increase in the stats, specifically for kind of the opioid crisis. And so you're seeing people on the ground seeing changes, seeing needles on the ground, and then the NYP data is a little bit different. So I don't know if that's a citywide issue, but I, I just wanted to let, let you know that that's, that's happening, and we'd like to maybe work with you to figure out what, what the discrepancy is all about. Second, I'm thinking about the, the focus for South Bronx is real, and how do we get in front of it in other neighborhoods where we're just seeing the beginning stages of some of this, and the disposal programs, for example, is an, ex uh, is an opportunity for us to kind of think about our parks and other locations and that are ready and able and willing, and, uh, and is, it, is it but for the funding issue? And so how do, we, how do we take a very active community right now, like in Sunset Park, uh, that I'm seeing that wants to do something proactive, that want, um, that that is seeing both the kind of immigration issues come up, and they're there. There's a very kind of great coalition, and um, uh, shelters, uh, uh, hotel shelters, and and then they're kind of uh, overlaying this this crisis, the opioid crisis, on top of it, and wanting to do something. How do we how do we bring the resources to this community and work together to do that? We're, ha we're ha I mean, I'm speaking for many agencies. This is not just a health department uh, work, but we're happy to talk more and think more with you. Um, I'll just add that, you know, in, in the case of the kiosks, when we were first talking about it, I think there were some real community concerns also, and I think one thing that's happened since um, they've gone in is that it's earned the endorsement of community members. Initially, it was, I think, seen as a negative flag for their community or potentially a, 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 a way to draw problems or draw challenges. I think now, already, just after implementing for a short time, we're very um, glad to see community support and we're glad after meetings and speaking with people to see that they feel that it's an asset. So if you are aware of other communities that would welcome it, we should, uh, we're happy to speak more. Great. I'll follow up on that and we'll make sure to bring that, that effort. The last thing is, is how many of, 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 of the, uh, impacted or impacted neighbors, users, English language learners, non-English speaking people? New Yorkers. Do we have a sense of that? So, um, so we have. Let me. I'll, I'll share with you what we do know. We don't. We don't. There are some limits to our data. So the f uh, folks who who die of uh, overdose deaths, we don't always know what their primary language is. Um, I think what we know about the Bronx is that. Um, the highest number of people who have died of overdose in the Bronx are Latino. We know Latino communities in the South Bronx in particular are um, predominantly Puerto Rican. We know that many of those folks in those communities have been here for many years and in fact are bilingual, monolingual English, and then some monolingual Spanish speakers. 
I can share with you that in the Bronx, all of our outreach uh, and materials is always in at least English and Spanish. And in other parts of the city, we are also conscious of producing materials and hiring staff or working with community-based organizations that have staff that can deliver services in languages uh, specific to the population in that area. So for example, uh, in another part of Brooklyn, Coney Island, uh, we are attentive to large numbers of Russian-speaking uh, folks and try to certainly make all of our print materials as well as services available in, in Russian and English by way of example. I just want to note that I think when, when uh, a question was asked earlier about what can, what, what can we all do and outreach, outreach, outreach was the answer. This is one of those things that I think we wait until we get to the problem that we realize we didn't put in a... Uh, a robust understanding. And so I hope the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is working with you on this, and if they're not, they should be, and really thinking about how they 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 bring their um, um, knowledge, understanding, and ability to communicate to everyone. So that, that, that is not a barrier. Thank you for that. Thank you. Council Member Salamanca. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to get to, uh, first I want to do some fact checking here. We just to point out that the, uh, the Bronx Opioid Collective was created by my office and Acacia to address the, uh, the opioid issue on 149th Street and to bring attention to it. And it was um, my office working in conjunction with Diana Ayala um, and the, the rest of the council especially in the BNT, to ensure that we got them the funding necessary so that they can kick this program off. Um, in 2014, the mayor went and visited the whole with then Commissioner Gilbert Taylor. Um, and the community knew that there was an issue with um, opioid use, heroin use in that whole. Um, but the mayor, in my opinion, went there held a press conference, took some pictures, cleared the area up, but never created a plan to address the issue of opioid in that area. And what happened was that the users now decided to go onto the streets and start using with what I call in your face, where they were injecting in the streets on 151st Street by Immaculate Conception. They were injecting in um, St. Mary's, um, Mary's Park. They were, they were out there. What was your, the administration's plan to address that issue back in 2014? And why did it take to the end of 2018 for DOH to actually do something about it? So I, um, so first of all, Bronx Opioid Collective, I know that your office was, was key to that work and I really acknowledge uh, that how, what a, it's uh, it's strength in the South Bronx. So I, I, I to both Council Member Ayala and to you, um, I just um, so that the work around the whole. Um, let me let me also just point out to uh, DOHMH uh, and sort of the changes that have uh, been undertaken with Healing NYC. No, if you can just answer that specifically, because uh, I want to. I, I it, don't have it, much time, and I want to um, get to my other questions. So it, it, it's relevant because the city for a long period of time had very little capacity to address substance use as a city. Most of the funding was in treatment programs. And so in 2014, for example, we had a staff at the health department of 30 people addressing substance use. So one of the very large transitions that's taken place is of the many programs you've heard about, including the ones that are newly coming online, is an enhanced capacity to do engagement-oriented work that isn't about waiting for people to come in for care. It's about going to find people. So what I'm aware of with the whole and the, and the issues both coming uh, prior to closing the whole was that a lot of efforts were made to go in beforehand to reach people who were there to offer them care. And this was done across city agencies, colleagues at Department of Social Services, uh, uh, police. Uh, this was not at that time a primary role of the health department. It 
what I think I will share with you is that we have been doing work. You've been doing work through the Bronx Opioid Collective. We've been adding on new care since 2017 and will continue to enhance that work going forward. But I very much hear what you're saying, and we want to go forward and continue to fix this problem. On uh, 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, 148th Street, and closed by, by Diana Yala's district. See, this is, this is a very personal to Diana and I because that's our border. And this is what I called ground zero for opioid use and, in, in the city of New York. In that immediate area, even going up to 151st Street, there are 30, okay, 30 opioid-related healthcare facilities methadone clinics, clinics, needle exchange programs, and on and on and on and on. That is why there is a high concentration of opioid use in that area. How can the city have allowed all these programs to be concentrated in that area? Now, it, it, and, and then my second part is, does the city coordinate with OASIS, the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, do you coordinate when we're talking about siting for these areas? Because it's easy for the city to say, oh, we have no control over those licenses. That's the state, and the state it approves them. But is there coordination? Does the city and the state talk and say, there are too many of these programs in this area. Let's spread them out. So in answer to, to, to two questions, one is, to my knowledge, there have not been new physical substance use disorder treatment programs in that area since in the time period we're, we're talking about. So the major these programs predated this time period. Um, so that's one, one issue. One which, which time period? Well, certainly since 2014 and even uh, before since, uh, to my knowledge. Um, so we do coordinate, the, the process is as follows. We coordinate with OASS when a new treatment program desires to open a new location, part of the certification process, which is a state process. They are required to have a, uh, what's called a consultation with the city. And we, uh, as a city, make a recommendation about whether, about the location and about the content of the services. So we very much do coordinate. You know, right now, I just got wind that on 152nd Street in Elton, there's an organization that's trying to open up a, a substance abuse inpatient facility. I, I wonder if um, your DOHMH was aware of that. Um, and, and I'm just asking because I want to know if this coordination with OASIS and DOH actually exists. Let me, let me get back. We will get right. back to you, Council Member. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, my other question is um, safe havens. Do you, do you know how a safe haven operates or does, does DOHMH know what a safe haven actually is other than it just being a shelter? Uh, we, we are aware of them and we do work with Department of Social Services in terms of the harm reduction approach or access and linkage to care and services. And it sounds like, as you know, they're run out of DSS. All right. So if so does DOH and DHS speak to each other before they are opening up a safe haven in a certain community? You know, safe havens are for those individuals that are homeless, that are chronically homeless, which 95% of them have substance abuse, um, substance abuse uh, problems. And they're living in, you know, inhabitable conditions, most of them underneath bridges, stairways. And so to convince them to get them off the street, they say, hey, we'll give you a bed with no restrictions. So you can come in and out as you please, but the goal here is to take them off the streets. And my, you know, and so that's why I want to know, does DOHMH and DHS actually speak to each other? Because in my opinion, putting a safe haven where there is a high concentration of methadone clinics and heroin use and drug use is a recipe for disaster. I think the city is you know, creating a monster and you know, the, making the situation worse than improving that situation. We, so, so does DOH and so DHS coordinate? We before? do coordinate services. We typically don't directly get involved with siting before that happens. 
but from the content programming side of things we do. All right, well, question that. Um, the, uh, the $8 million, and by the way, you know, I, I, I am a big supporter of, of getting um, individuals who are addicted to opioid the help that they need. When the mayor announced a safe injection site, one of them was in my location, and I accepted it with open arms. My only concern was the siting of the location, which is something that the administration said we can work with. So to hear that, you know, uh, the, the Bronx Action Plan will dedicate $8 million solely to the Bronx for programming and advertising, it's extremely exciting to me. Um, and, and I thank you for that. But I have yet to see the Bronx Action Plan in paper. When can we get that? I mean, it's good to sit in a press conference and say, I came up with a plan. I haven't read it. When, do I, when can I get access to this plan? We will get it to you soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, now, is there money dedicated to help NYPD with enforcement as part of this plan uh, to address the, the, the drug dealing that's happening? And I'll explain why. Um, Diana and I, I'm sorry, Count the Chair Ayala and I, we share the 4-0 precinct. Mm -hmm. And um, and we're constantly having conversations with Inspector Hennessy. And I think he's a very competent, um, and well-spoken. I really like him. But I want to make sure that he has the resources necessary. Does the 4-0 precinct have the manpower to, number one, patrol 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, which after Times Square has the most foot traffic in the city of New York, has one of the highest concentrations of NYCHA developments in the city of New York, okay, has one of the highest crime uh, districts in the city of New York, and also has to address and has to patrol these areas where there's high concentration of drug dealing and homeless shelters. I'm uh, that being Inspector Brian McMahon from the Patrol Borough Bronx. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, the 4-0 is actually doing a phenomenal job, like you said, under Inspector Hennessy. Uh, right now, uh, he's experiencing a, sp uh, a dip in crime uh, year to date. Uh, he's also worked with the bid and yourself about uh, putting extra resources into the, the district, especially 149 and 3rd. So right now, um, the overall belief is that he has enough resources to address the conditions he's facing. Yeah. I would have to respectfully disagree. I think that Inspector Hennessy and the Foro Precinct need more resources. They need more officers to help them again. Number one, you know, with, with NYCHA development, with the 149th Street, yes, you added a, a task force to deal with that corridor, but they need more resources. And I don't think that they have the, the enough manpower to really, you know, have a presence in that community to serve as a deterrent for those drug dealers. Um, and then my last question, um, in speaking to some higher-ups in NYPD, um, some of their frustrations were that the judges, when you're arresting these low-level drug dealers uh, the, the, and they go to the criminal court, the judges are either not giving them, you know, enough sense, you know, an adequate sentence, or they're putting them in programs opposed to actually giving them jail time for selling illegal drugs. Uh, is NYPD having a good conversation or coordinating or in discussions with the district attorney and the judges and asking them for help? And again, I don't think that, I don't think that arresting individuals is a solution for this opioid problem. I think programming and getting into programs is the right way, but those, that's for the users. The dealers, we need to address them in a separate way. We're in conversations with all the district attorney's offices, um, talking about when diversion is appropriate, when it's not appropriate, and those are ongoing conversations. I think the, the heat teams will be pre-arrest, trying to reach everybody, including people who are low-level dealers who are users. Um, but we are in constant conversations with the DAs. All right. Thank you. If there's a message that we're getting out of here, we have to get the Foral Precinct more resources, and we need to get a copy of this Bronx Action Plan. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Councilmember Powers? Thank you. Um, I want to just taking some of the lessons here and making them more citywide, I also want to talk about, uh, and it's in your testimony too, the frequently prescribed opioid medications and the role of that uh, uh, of 
of prescriptions and the access. Um, can you can you tell us any efforts that the city is taking to ensure that uh, we're not over prescribing and that we are uh, limiting access where we can? It's of course related to not solving trying to solve the problem at the end of it, but trying to prevent access in the first hand. And is there is there a role for the city in that? What is the role? What limitations do we have versus state and federal in terms of uh, limiting and, and being preventative in access? Um, sure, thank you for that question. So this, the city health department is involved in a number of ways. One is we have issued guidance for what we call judicious opioid prescribing, that is less risky forms of prescribing. We issued those guidelines uh, first um, in the prior administration and just recently released them in order to ensure that prescribers know about them, we disseminate them widely using what we call a, a public health detailing strategy. We go door to door visiting practices to make sure that prescribers know about what we recommend and urge them to adhere to those guidelines. We have visited more than 3,000 prescribers over the last couple of years to do that. And we've evaluated our efforts that show decreases in high dose or ri the riskiest form of prescribing uh, in two of those three efforts. We also, as a city, have um, sued the uh, manufacturers and distributors of opioid uh, prescription or prescription painkillers um, based on the fact of marketing and, and distribution that far exceeded what was sort of best practices are known scientifically. Um, we, the state, maintains a prescription monitoring program database. Uh, because of state law, prescribers are mandated to check that database for before prescribing any controlled substance. And that has uh, been part of what, together with what we believe our city efforts, have led to decreased uh, uh, patients from seeking multiple prescriptions from multiple providers through multiple pharmacies. We also use that database, although we don't have identified information, as an overall evaluation of the n amount of prescribing that's happening in the city. And we know from that database that prescribing has gone down on a per capita basis. And can you tell us how much it's gone down and what time period? Um, I, need, I need to look for specific numbers. We can get that back to you. It's since when we first had the data become available in 2012 through our last available data is through 2017, and I can get you that exact number. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and I, as you follow this issue nationwide, um, one, of the, one of the cities uh, that has been, I would say, devastated but re recovering is Dayton, Ohio. It's actually where I went to college. It's a city I follow very well. Dateline and the New York Times have actually re um, have done a lot of coverage around their efforts to – it's an economic distressed area, high usage. There has been uh, – New York Times has a coverage that it was a 54 percent reduction in fatal overdoses over one year, which seems like a one place to, to – even though there's a high usage to look at in terms – terms of um, uh, how do we how do we learn from other cities that have been dealing with this maybe as long or longer? Um, the New York Times credited Medicaid expansion and abundance uh, of naloxone as major factors in decline. I'm wondering, um, New York City, which has a robust Medicaid program, has uh, 60 million dollars invested in opioid treatment and prevention. Whether we are uh, expecting to achieve similar declines, when, and if there are other efforts in other cities that we uh, should be taking, and if of course if those need legislation legislative support, whether we should be looking at them? Uh, so uh, a, a couple of things I just want to mention about Dayton and other jurisdictions. One thing to just be aware of, the way in which our epidemic is differing from ep other epidemics, particularly in the Midwest, uh, is that for the entire period of our epidemic, we've had lower proportion of overdoses involving prescription opioids than almost other every other jurisdiction across the country. Our problem throughout this whole period has been dominated by heroin and more uh, recently fentanyl, so just for context. 
not to say we're not we're letting up on prescription opioids. I think Dayton saw some quick wins because of Medicaid expansion and because there was real pent up demand for treatment. I think it is possible that we would have had a worse epidemic had we not had treatment as available as it is, though we have more work to do. We have the largest naloxone distribution in the country, and I am confident, and, and we get together and with Deputy Commissioner Herman and representatives from other city agencies, and we were just doing this this morning to think about best strategies to distribute that naloxone. I'll just also add to the Dayton, Ohio experience that was also mentioned in the same article is that they saw a brief uptick in carfentanil, which is, uh, um, and for those of you who are aware, an even more potent form of fentanyl. That carfentanyl appeared and then seemed to disappear. The article didn't attribute to what reason it disappeared, but the um, health department there and other and colleagues felt that the disappearance of carfentanyl was also contributing to the decrease in fatal overdoses. The last thing I'll say um, is to really sort of call out the the work of our administration is we are all in conversation with jurisdictions around the country, borrowing from stealing from what other people have found to work. And in fact, our relay program, which is the 24-7 post non-fatal overdose program, was based on an earlier pilot in another state. We adapted it for the New York City context. We would like to think we approved upon it. And this is what allowed us to both pilot and now scale that up. Thank you. And I, I appreciate the distinction between the jurisdictions, but also the usage. And But I but just on the opioid side, one and just, just in general, this, the DOH, I think it was probably two or three years ago, had partnered with folks around a drug take-back program um, could you just tell us any any metrics or level of success in terms of, or how do we measure our success in terms of the drug take back program? Uh, so drug take back programs, it was it was not actually the city health department that those take back programs have often been conducted by DEA sponsoring local events. I think NYPD has sponsored some events. We think they are good strategies to raise awareness. Often the result is tracked in uh, pounds or tons of total medications. We don't know how much are actually opioids often, unfortunately. Um, we think that we have also messaged to uh, patients to dispose of medications by um, mixing them with noxious substances, kitty litter, coffee grounds, so forth. Um, and in the city, we have also, uh, after much discussion with uh, uh, environmental folks, as the FDA does recommended flushing where other means of disposal are not necessary. Increasingly, pharmacies are also having boxes to take back medication, and so we want to make it part of everybody's daily routines to take unused medicines out of medicine cabinets. Thank you. Councilmember Gibson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Ayala and Chair Richards. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you here. Um, first and foremost, certainly appreciate all of the work that's being done by DOHMH, NYPD, and really a lot of the other agencies. Um, I think you know today's topic is very relevant when it relates to the opioid crisis in Bronx County, um, but I do appreciate, Assistant Commissioner, the acknowledgement that a lot of the addictions that we have suffered in the Bronx have been well before this administration. Um, and so I, I really want to appreciate a lot of the work that's being done. Uh, Chair Ayala and Councilmember Salamanca representing the South Bronx. Um, but I share Marisena with Councilmember Salamanca and I share Highbridge with Councilmember Ayala. Um, so this is very, very important to me. Um, and the numbers, I mean, we know the numbers, we know the data, certainly the faces of, you know, behind the numbers are, are community members and residents and family members. And I don't think for for a lot of New Yorkers, the recognition of the real crisis that we have. And even before Healing NYC, before Thrive, we still face challenges in the Bronx. Um, and I'm grateful that there has been a very aggressive approach to going after you know, the abusers, uh, those who are using, but really making sure that we 
develop a real plan from a holistic perspective and not just a law enforcement perspective. Law enforcement has its work to do, but law enforcement are not social workers. Um, we work with them, but this to me is really a public health crisis. And because of that, it leads to a public safety crisis as well. Um, so I just had a few questions specifically about the announcement that was made uh, last week with the mayor when he was in the Bronx. And I wanted to understand a little bit further of what we're doing um, in the borough that I represent. Um, so I wanted to first ask, in terms of the, the naloxone distribution, we have already given out 20,000 naloxone kits in the Bronx. By the end of this year, we are adding an additional 15,000. So of that 15,000, we've already started to distribute, correct? Or is that all in the 20,000? So... I will check my number, okay. but we will reach 15,000 just in this calendar year. Okay. The 20,000 represents since the start since of Healing start, NYC right. in okay. March so of 2017. Additional. Okay. And initially when we started distributing naloxone kits, uh, they were all given to all of the members of service in the NYPD, um, new recruits that are graduating from the academy, and then we started to expand. So who are the stakeholders that are now getting these naloxone kits? Um, so besides, council member, yes, besides PD. The, the place that we actually started naloxone distribution were uh, with people who themselves were at risk for overdose, people okay. who use drugs, mm -hmm. and their social networks. And I want to call out in particular the uh, syringe service programs, the syringe exchange programs, who were really early adopters of this practice, really counseling and working with their clients around risk reduction, uh, safety planning and naloxone kit distribution. As we um, continued down this path, we expanded naloxone kit distribution to many different kinds of organizations who could sign up to be opioid overdose prevention programs and give mm -hmm. kits out to clients. This includes treatment, uh, substance use disorder treatment programs, uh, shelters, and they were also, those two constituents were also sort of early to this uh, work. I would say that uh, we're very fortunate that PD also uh, became interested and willing to carry naloxone kits, and that is certainly happening. One new program I'll just mention since you're asking is a program that started in September of this year, and that is um, FDNY EMS are, uh, have started in naloxone leave behind program. If they respond to uh, a suspected overdose, they will offer a naloxone kit to the person who experienced an overdose if they're awake and able to, to get some information, as well as anyone else in the scene, friends or family member. So we are looking for an, every opportunity to get naloxone and information uh, into the hands of people who could be at risk or in a position to witness an overdose. Okay. So in the Bronx, there are a number of community-based organizations that have really started at the even well before this administration um, called Not 62 campaign, which is our borough-wide effort to really focus on health disparities like heart disease, diabetes, and childhood obesity. Um, it involves a number of CBOs, local hospitals, uh, school-based health centers, and others like Bronx Health Reach, Institute for Family Health, um, and many, many others. Uh, the list is very long. But what I appreciate about this collaborative collaborative effort is that it involves not traditional stakeholders, so clergy, um, faith-based organizations are involved. So with the work that you're talking about, the public service campaign, um, and really expanding into areas where, you know, we normally may not necessarily have a relationship with them, what is the work that you're doing in concert with the Bronx District Public Health Office with Dr. Jane Bedell, who I love, um, her office does great work, but are we looking at expanding on these opportunities, the local community boards, and all the other outlets that already exist where we have uh, an audience of people to talk to? Um, so thanks for that question. And um, uh, I want to particularly mention Dr. Bedell and the Bronx, Bronx Action Center, who is already distributing naloxone. They are active participants. 
in the coalition that you mentioned, and we are, as well as a couple of other organizations uh, that are already distributing naloxone and doing much of much of the work that we're describing. So that's exactly the approach we want to expand upon: is thinking about non-traditional partners, engaging with organizations and coalitions that already exist who are working on other health issues, other economic issues, other. Uh, issues that are pertinent to the Bronx to continue to expand our messaging, naloxone, access to care, engagement, uh, building upon the work, the good work that's already happening. Okay. Can you just explain a little bit about the relay program? Because you are expanding to a third hospital in the Bronx, and it happens to be my hospital, Great. Bronx Care, formerly Bronx Lebanon. Um, and they have two large sites, one on the concourse, one on Fulton. Uh, tremendous amount of work with you know local stakeholders on the ground. So what would that program look like to an average constituent to uh, one of my residents? Uh, so I think to the average constituent, it may actually end up being invisible because okay. it is a very targeted program. What the health department is doing is deploying peer uh, coaches, we call them wellness advocates, to the emergency department when we are called 24-7 to work with somebody after they come into the emergency department after a non-fatal overdose. Okay. The hospital, the partner hospital just calls a single line and we dispatch the peer worker. So we're up and running at St. Barnabas. Uh, we've been very, they've been great partners. We'll, we're, we're very excited to be working with them and we're really looking forward to working with Bronx Care as well. Um, in terms of the specifics about the sites, we are based in the emergency department, so that's our, that's our primary site. Um, and as programs rolled out, uh, roll out, we've learned that we start in one site typically. As things are up and running and going well, we're able to expand if they have a secondary emergency department site nearby, as, as in the case. Okay. So in the network of stakeholders that we're actively working with as well as expanding on, what is the relationship with the medical professional sector in terms of doctors, nurse practici practitioners? Because in many of the cases that I personally know of with an opioid um, addiction or misuse, it usually starts at the very beginning from a pain management, from an injury, and that patient is prescribed pain medication, and then for whatever reason, the pain medication stops. And and then that patient has to find, you know, meds somewhere, the black market, et cetera. Um, so what are the conversations we're having with the medical professionals? Because they play a crucial role in this process. And all the great work we're doing, we certainly don't want their work to counter what we're doing. So have there been active conversations? Are we looping them in on all of these efforts and initiatives that we're embarking on? A lot of looping. <laughs> okay, I can imagine. Uh, and arm twisting. Um, you know, I think uh, health professionals want to do the right thing, and they need the accurate information and resources, just like we're talking about community members, just like we're talking about law enforcement. So we are actively working with the health professions community, not only around promoting judicious opioid prescribing, that is shorter duration, lower doses, only when needed. And as I think you were in the room when I was speaking with Council Member Salamanca or some, someone else uh, about our uh, public health detailing campaign where we go door to door. We've reached more than 3,000 prescribers in New York City around various guidance that we issued around the opioid epidemic and we'll continue to do that. Additionally, we are really uh, working hard to engage health professionals in, can, in getting the training and then starting to prescribe the medication called buprenorphine, which is one of the most effective treatments for opioid addiction. We are hosting trainings in which they get information about addiction generally, as well as prescribing the medication buprenorphine, and then we are providing help, technical assistance to those practices to help them get going and begin to offer treatment to patients in primary care and other settings. Okay, great. Um, so I had one final question, but before I get to that, I did want to uh, also echo the sentiments of Councilmember Salamanca in terms of the partnership with OASIS. Um, as a former state legislator, I cannot tell you how important that is. And then in January, it's going to be even more important um, when things change. Um, but it's really essential because of the ongoing work that OASIS is doing. And I know while you indicated that you're not involved in terms of citing locations of methadone clinics and drug treatment programs,
programs, but you know that work, again, we don't want it to be counter to what we're doing. And so if you look at the borough of the Bronx and you look at where many of these facilities are located, they're all in the same communities, the same distressed communities of color where you have the most addictions and the most people using drugs. So as we have future conversations, it's really important that our partners in Albany understand that they have to work with us in terms of new contracts, citing these facilities, because until that dynamic changes, we're going to have the same challenges over and over and over again. And with a lot of the success we have, all of the money we're expending, we certainly don't want Albany to do things that's not in line with what we're doing. So that's my one plug. My second plug is on the syringe expansion program, and I know this is really parks and sanitation, but even with the initial announcement, most of the locations are the largest parks we have, um, particularly St. Mary's Park in the Bronx. But I want to encourage you, as you talk to Commissioner Silver and Commissioner Garcia, that the playgrounds are very very important too and people are complaining to us about you know the syringe use the needles everywhere in the smaller playgrounds as well so yes the big parks need attention but please don't forget the small playgrounds um, my final question is about the public health diversion centers um, I think I've been having this conversation for a while when I chaired public safety and we were talking about alternatives to arrests and allowing officers an option on taking individuals who um, were using drugs into a safe space, a safe location, um, because many instances when they go to the emergency room, they stay there for hours and they're discharged, and who knows where they go. So the $90 million commitment we have, the two providers, I believe the last time we talked, uh, Deputy Commissioner, we were talking about a site in East Harlem, so I wanted to know if you had an update for us on our diversion centers. I I think we will have uh, an update very soon. Uh, I know it's been a long-standing oh, conversation. Words. Soon and very soon. The hurry up and wait approach. <laughs> Not by the end of the year, probably early next year. Early, uh, I think next year. But I think things are. Uh, we're very um, optimistic that things are moving forward. And I know we've been. I've been talking with you and Council Member Ayala for for a while about that. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you, Chair Ayala, for all the work you've done. Um, you know, this is not just a profession for us, but we take this very, very personal, as we all do. Um, and so I appreciate the work of, you know, the department, the agencies, and encourage us to continue to talk um, and make sure we are talking to people on the ground. There's nothing like advocates and stakeholders and people who are affected um, who can really be the powerful voices at the table. So I appreciate it. And thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Holden. Uh, thank you, Chairs, for holding this important hearing. Um, no neighborhood is exempt from the opioid crisis, as we know. Uh, my neighborhood has been in Queens has been hit hard. Um, I'd, I'd like to focus on the uh, public awareness campaign, the Living Proof, um, which we all see. We can't turn on a TV without seeing a pharmaceutical commercial, and we're seeing hundreds of them. Yet we don't see as many on the, on the opioid crisis. And I don't remember a campaign. It should be a national campaign um, put out there. But certainly a city should be doing this round the clock on, on many stations. I know it's expensive. But um, it, it's really hard. I don't, I don't know who to target on this because it runs the gamut, the ages, uh, the demographics. Um, and how do you reach them with a public service campaign? Um, it's a it's a tough you know it's really tough but it, it really should go out there it should be on bus shelters anything that the city owns or the city contracts out we should have the message out there Be again it's hitting everyone it's hitting everyone hard and we need to involve the drug companies obviously I guess we're trying we're, we're suing them but how do you plan to de de deliver the living proof um, campaign because it's a good testimonials on people's you know lives. It's a very very important um, way to reach everyone. But how do you deliver it? So um, thank you for the question, and I think that's something that we think uh, awfully hard about when we launch a new campaign or rerun an additional campaign. Um, as you point out, uh, running things on television is expensive, um, and it doesn't always reach uh, uh, people who may be more on social media and other 
ways of consuming information. So we increasingly, in addition to television, the Living Proof uh, during its last run also ran on social media, including Facebook, including Twitter. Um, we also use print campaigns. And as you point out, we do use bus shelters and buses, as well as subways to disseminate uh, a variety of health department messages. In our campaigns, we also use our data around uh, non-fatal non and fatal overdose to target areas of the city in particular, uh, using through our media contracts ways to target messaging to people both age and geographically who we want to reach. And then finally, we have used the testimonial style ads um, uh, and in that way, we can include a range of New Yorkers, a range of both ages, race, experiences in an offer, in an effort to reach people as, as effectively as we can. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one other question. Um, I love the fact that we can go, over, go after the uh, drug dealers, the big drug dealers, and hold them responsible for the overdoses, the deaths. Um, have there, uh, and I might ask, might ask the chief this, but have there been some high-profile convictions on this? That you know, how, do we have that we we can put out? We can actually advertise that you do this, you kill people, you'll be going to jail, and you're held responsible for murder or you, whatever the charge would be. That you're going away for a long time. I mean, I'd love to see that you know as to go out there to the masses, to the media, and this person was convicted, and he killed five people. Or you know, he killed three or whatever. We, we do do that. As I previously has said, we pick up a case on every overdose, and particularly the deaths. And we've had our success with the federal charge of uh, distributing a controlled substance resulting in a death. It's a minimum of 20 years, um, which is impactful considering what we were dealing with prior to this, trying to figure out how we're going to tackle this problem. We do, um, um, many times we do do press conferences announcing these takedowns and these charges. Um, you, you'll see them. We just did. Can, can um, you give me a case we, where somebody, you know, killed three people or four people, they were charged with that? You want to talk about the yeah. school teacher? And, and they were convicted, not just charged, but they were convicted. Most recently, we, uh, we earlier this year in 2018, we arrested the person who personally uh, delivered the product that killed our public school teacher up in the Bronx. Uh, public school, I think it was 811. So uh, that is one case from earlier this year. I cannot get into further because I don't know where in the inve in the prosecution that case is right now. I don't know if it's been finished, uh, but that that's one high case that we have. No, but is there any case that you can say this person was convicted? He's he's doing time now for three deaths or four deaths. Uh, that was last year or the year before. Do we have any of those? Not, not, not that I can give you off the top of my head. All right, but that's what we need to get. That, that's we need to they, put these guys away. They exist. We can get back. Sorry. They do exist. They do exist, but let's get yeah. them out there. Let's back. use them, yeah. and and actually scare off other deals. Wait a minute, you know yeah. this is they're going to get, they're going to be put away for a very long time if they are are peddling these the drugs. And it's killing people. The uh, the issue is is that we just started this last year, and as you know, with the court proceedings, it, it takes some time. So I I think the reason why we're not able to give you those convictions, although there may be a handful, we just started you really using this law, this federal law, within the last year. So they wouldn't have gone to trial already. For the most part, many of them haven't gone to trial. Um, but there there are numerous occasions where we have made these arrests. But the trial will take. So the, the federal law is only a year old. No, no, no. What I'm saying is we've concentrated on, on the these overdoses, with these deaths, with the overdose teams. With last year it was beginning beginning of last year okay. that we've really focused in on them, and we've really tried to take these and prosecute these individuals poisoning people yeah. within our community. Okay. When we get them, though, when we actually when they actually go to jail, we need to yeah, yeah. put that yeah, out right. everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, just last two questions. Uh, why don't you think uh, throwing uh, resources, I guess, to the 40th precinct, uh, why don't you think that would uh, assist 
And I know Councilmember Salamanca was pushing certainly for more resources. I don't as think well. anybody in the police department would say no to more resources, but okay. it's not up to us to decide here who gets right. more. And do you but think that will assist in cleaning up the neighborhood temporarily until these programs come online? I, I don't think anybody would say that more resources aren't a good thing, but we have to balance the whole city. Okay. I, um, if I may, I just want to clarify that the, the heat pr program is already active, came online this month, and, and so this is right now. Okay, so since it's come online, so what have we heat seen? is the new resource that's coming okay. online, and Bronx Hope will right. be okay. coming online very soon. Those are two big initiatives. Uh, it came know. online as of December? Uh, um, as, as of, of uh, last November. month, yeah. but still, you know, getting set up and happening. So and, and, we're and beginning to work through it, and we're hopeful we'll see impact soon. And how much staffing? So there are, so uh, overall heat has um, teams throughout the city and in the Bronx there are two dedicated teams, each consisting of two people running 16 hours a day. And, so, and however, uh, there are other teams to draw upon. Some of the other teams are, are getting staffed up. And since uh, these four individuals, two in the Bronx you said? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, the jury's still out on that I'm assuming, so you're Right, so we're mo obviously monitoring very carefully in terms of numbers of responses, what happens to those responses, and and we're ha and we'll happy to. And do they get wear a special you. color T-shirt, a vest, or what? So they are uh, mm -hmm. coming soon. Those Getting special swag. special okay. uh, outfits. Um, yes, they'll be recognizable. Okay, um, last question because I don't think we got the the clear answer on this. So, the people are selling. Going back to that on the street. Are these the same ones who are adding the fentanyl, or is that happening at a higher level? Higher level. Higher, typically it's at a higher level. It's happening at a higher level. Yeah. You want to answer that to that? You look like I just, just to clarify, just something. So we were going back and saying about fentanyl, and, and I was listening to the doctor. So we've consistently seen an increase in, in fentanyl through the years. So from if you look at the lab, and you'll see it doubled from 2016. And then you look at the percentages of fentanyl and heroin. So back in 2016, it was 17%. And pretty much half of the heroin that's coming in right now contains some sort of fentanyl or fentanyl analog. Who's who's, who's so, so, so when you look at, I'm gonna get yeah. to that. So when you look at that, we have a specialized major investigation team that targets and exactly what you're saying. Where is this coming in from? And They've targeted specifically the Bronx. This year, they brought in, and heroin, if half of heroin contains fentanyl, they brought in 734 pounds of heroin. So where does that come from? It seems like the Bronx is, is it's, it's a thoroughfare for bringing in that heroin, at least from our major case investigations. It's originating, as Chief McCormick had said, from China, that's where it's manufactured, and then also Mexico, and then along the way, it could be cut in. The fentanyl could be cut into the heroin at any, any sort of the process. And, and if you look at, okay. Okay. Go ahead, keep talking. So if you, if you look at, if you look Deputy at- Deputy Commissioner. <laughs> Leave him alone. What do, you, what do you want to know? Go ahead. I want to hear. I want him to keep talking. Go ahead. So if, if you look at and just look I at. I can see if you tap him on the leg she, from here, just, right? So she, watching. She, she was going to. <laughs> but if you, if you look at fentanyl, too, it's like, so 2016, it was in a tablet form 20% of the time. And that's kind of dissipated. It's only 2% of the time now. So the issue is the fentanyl. The fentanyl being cut into the heroin as you're trying to figure out at which stage we are too, and that's where we're targeting. We're targeting that. We have the specialized major case investigations going on, the countries as it's coming in, JFK, we have a task force in JFK, getting it as it's coming in. But we are getting these investigations going to try to get those people cutting in the fentanyl and the heroin. Right, now, so why is the Bronx is it the, the water? Is it why? Why is the Bronx Wait, the, the, this specific? No, no. I'm just saying yeah. the Bronx seems to be the place where it's at. 
It, it could so, be the, the thoroughfare, you know, coming in from other states. So you cut through New Jersey, going through the Bronx. It could be coming from, from the north, cutting in. Um, you know, but, but we have seen 75% of the major investigation seizures of heroin is coming from the Bronx this year. Okay. It was 700 pounds. That's a lot. Yeah, and, a, and you're not seeing the fentanyl being added locally is the question. It, it's, it's not that it, it could be cut in anywhere from China and Mexico to, to the Bronx or to any other, uh, any other uh, county within New York City. Just wait a second. It could be done at any stage, but I'm assuming but you're if it's some of the low level dealers. Right, all right, right. But right. the answer is yes. It can be done at high level, it can be done at any level. If that's what you're all right, give me a, a percentage then. Do you think it's half and half? Do you think it's 20% locally? I would assume that it's coming in more from the top. Yeah. Come on back up. I cannot provide you with a percentage on where it's being done. I cannot. I can tell you that we conduct investigations on a local level, say, for instance, a block, a geographical area within a borough, two boroughs within our city, our city, both through our country and also internationally. But I can't give you a percentage. Or but are you seeing it cut in? locally in some of the I don't know I don't know what you mean by locally locally is the fit fentanyl being added when you it, for the cases that you have seen I don't want you to go into any open investigations but would you suggest that it's happening before it comes into the Bronx or I, in the I, Bronx it's being added the fentanyl on a few different investigations it is being mixed in the Bronx a few it does very rare does fentanyl come into this country in pure, in pure form. It's not. Okay. Explain how it does come in. It, it, it's coming in through various compounds, both through Mexico and through China. Right. So bigger so deal is correct. Okay. All right. That's what I was trying to get at. Okay. We got our answer. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. You're welcome. Can you tell us if are all police officers trained to use naloxone? I don't think that was clear. We have almost all police officers have been trained to use naloxone. Okay. Almost everybody. Some uh, those who haven't are either on military leave, they're on extended leave, or they're in such administrative positions that it's be highly unlikely that they would use it. Now, uh, the, in regards to the public awareness campaign, I think this is for you, Hillary. Um, are we going to focus at all on the fact that cocaine is now also starting to be, you know, laced with fentanyl and that we have what appear to be prescription pills that are out on the market being sold um, that are also laced with fentanyl? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had two more questions. This is also for Dr. Kunis. Uh, so you mentioned that the outreach work, with, that you're doing outreach work with medical providers to educate them on best practices for opioid prescription. Is there any work being done with insurance companies to encourage physicians and patients by providing better reimbursements for non-opioid related alternatives such as physical therapy or anti-inflammatory creams? So we've, cer we've certainly been involved in, in speaking with insurance companies around those, around judicious opioid prescribing, about, around improving uh, coverage for non-opioid approaches to pain relief. Um, and, I, you know, I think more work needs to happen in that area by mm -hmm. not only the city but nationally as, as well. Okay. Um, so in regards to the, uh, the Bronx Action Plan, can you tell us how much of the $8 million in funding will be directed to Bronx-based support groups uh, and community-based organizations that connect people to treatment? So um, uh, there is, I, I believe, um, uh, 450000 sorry, going to increase outreach capacity for the three Bronx-based syringe exchange programs that will allow them 
to expand outreach or outreach teams. And what is the criteria that you're looking for from these uh, partnering organizations? So our criteria are that we want organizations who are skilled in, uh, I would say, the, the task of engaging people, meaning working with people who um, may have a range of health-related issues, including substance use, and are skilled in offering uh, the, the language that we often use with harm reduction is meeting the person where they're at, figuring out what they're, what kind of help they're interested and in, getting that help to connect with the person. Uh, that is a skill that in particular harm reduction really uses on a daily basis, uh, reaching out to people and pulling them into care, not sitting in an office yeah. waiting for people to show up. Understood. Now, uh, can you tell us how was the organization Radical Health selected? We've been hearing some feedback after the announcement from community um, activists that they're not really familiar with this program, this group? So Radical Health is um, a South Bronx-based organization led by a woman who is from the South Bronx, who is herself a Latina. And they have, she has not worked, uh, she takes, I would say, a community organizing approach to health, sort of a grassroots, engagement-oriented approach. I think, um, referring back to Councilmember Gibson's sort of really nice description of, of working with non-traditional partners, finding out what community members need and want, and, and working on strategies to improve health. So she's not worked uh, widely in the substance use or opioid uh, arena, and but has real strength in engaging some of the non-traditional partners who Councilmember Gibson named and more, and she has real skills in that area working with groups using a community organizing approach. Okay, and I think I lied. So I have two other questions, rapid questions. Um, so while I was in the Bronx this summer uh, canvassing my one block, um, I accidentally, I was photographing needles and as I, I accidentally walked into one of the drains, the drain was full of needles that had been disposed of improperly. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of, of needles. Worst case scenario, it rains, it floods, the needles come up onto the street. The, if that didn't happen, they drained somewhere. Now, I understand that they are captured, um, but the chemicals that are in the needles, the communicable diseases that are, you know, uh, in the needles, what, what is, is that like a concern? I don't, I don't like, you know, I don't want to be an alarmist, but that really, you know, bothered me because I, I think even when I was trying to get assistance, I don't think that there was a lot of experience with this kind of situation, which is kind of, you know, weird to me considering that we've been in the midst of this opioid epidemic for the last, you know, couple of years. Um, but it was the first time that I had seen it and it, it sounded to me or it looked to me like it was the first time that many of the city agencies that I was interacting with and in trying to figure out where this, you know, was all headed um, had no idea how to deal with this either. Yes. Um Thank you, and I thank you for sharing the picture um, and your concerns with us uh, previously. And I think that also highlighted some gaps in our ability as a city to clean up syringe litter, and which we believe will be filled by this this current plan. To our knowledge, um, that the fact of syringes being in the drain didn't pose risk of contamination of water supply um, or other environmental hazards beyond the, the the local one which I appreciate you thinking about me okay um, okay I think that the last question was really just around um, the, dispo the 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 pickup so we know that sanitation is going to be helping out and we're getting additional resources to the parks department which I also wanted to add for the record that I believe that they also would benefit from an addition of PEP officers because um, there is a need for more security in and around our local uh, playgrounds and, and parks. Um, but in regards to some of the harm reduction programs, so they give out, so they go to a specific area and they give out needles. This is, I think you and I worked, uh, my staff and I uh, worked with your office regarding an issue uh, similar to this in East Harlem. 
and so on 111th Street and Madison Avenue, apparently there's been some drug sales on 110th Street and Lexington Avenue, and people hide on 111th Street for some reason behind the garden, and they inject there, and then they dispose of the needles. Um, one of my local harm reduction uh, groups, knowing this, specifically targets that area for needle distribution, but they don't necessarily pick up the needles. Um, what is the plan? Will those programs then be tasked with coordinating services with sanitation? So we are hopeful that we will coordinate everybody's efforts so that we can are able to respond to problems like this more quickly. Um, we have found that syringe exchange programs, syringe service programs are, are really good community partners and we are happy to work with them if, if you know, when there are moments such as you, the one that you and I have discussed about exact locations and so forth that would be, be sort of better for community health. They are um, active about giving out personal, uh, they're called fit packs, personal syringe disposals, which, uh, so folks can dispose into little tiny mm -hmm. um, sort of boxes um, and collect those from participants as well as helping out with syringe collection. We want them to focus also on really working with people directly and want to support them. Though they are partners in collecting syringes, we want to be able to together work to make sure to decrease syringe litter. Okay. Anybody have any other additional questions? Just want to thank you for the work that uh, you're doing, and I think that uh, certainly uh, the work that all of you are doing signifies that we're looking to move into a different direction. Um, like I said, I don't think necessarily arresting our way out of this crisis is going to change where we're at as we've witnessed in the past so very good to see the NYPD is certainly taking steps big steps here as well recognizing this as a public health crisis rather than uh, arresting our way out of this issue so I look forward to continued work with you all uh, on this issue uh, and thank you thank you for your testimony today I look forward to catching up in the next few months to see how we're progressing thank you thank you